Do you still meet your counterpart? Do you still have a committee that are working? Uh, what, what is the status of the negotiation? We don't have any active negotiation. Since? Uh, two or three weeks. Um, I'll have the odd conversation, but not no real engagement, no real negotiating session. And uh, when you, we hear that you were close to a kind of a MOU, what was the basis of it? What was the well, the gentleman sitting next to Christy Freeland was Steve Verhul, Canada's chief NAFTA negotiator, who says that there has been no engagement, no negotiation of any substance between Canada and the United States since the G7 meeting two or three weeks ago. I find that terrifying. But let's go to an expert on negotiations and Canada-U.S. relations, our friend Manny Montenegrino, a former national partner at a serious law firm in Ottawa, former lawyer to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, and a political watcher who's the president and CEO of Think Sharp Incorporated. Manny, uh, I thought that was a bombshell. No conversation between Canada and the states in three weeks. What do you make of that? Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's falling into exactly what I've said. I don't think that this government, Justin Trudeau, wants to negotiate in good faith any trade agreement with the United States. I mean, if you think about it, the big, everyone is saying that uncertainty equals risk, risk equals collapse in market. All they're doing is adding more uncertainty. And I can only think partly is they want to ramp up the problems with the Trump hate voters in Canada, and this adds to what they want to do. Well, I, I looked through some reports by uh, leading Canadian banks. I'm talking about TD Bank, Scotia Bank, National Bank. These are not political outfits, I don't think. If they have any politics, I think they're pro-Canada and they're probably a little anti-Trump, to be honest. Each of them predicts an economic calamity. We're talking about, you know, 160,000 job losses, two uh, percent, uh, you know, recession kind of thing. So, how does Justin Trudeau know that those are the real scientific risks? So it's not just politics. We're talking about hundreds of thousands potentially jobs, Manny. How can that be part of a Trudeau strategy? Well, it, um, if you followed as I have very carefully. The beginning of 2018, our GDP was downward to 1.3%. We have lost, since 2018, 55,000 jobs. We have had our dollar drop about 10%. Now, if you think of it, our buying power from America, $350 billion, a 10% drop is equivalent to a tariff, if you want to call it, of importing goods of 10%. That's $35 billion that's going to cost all the uh, consumers in Canada. So we have already been on a downward trend. And this government, it not because of NAFTA, because of a lot of other things it's done. So if you can wrap everything up in NAFTA and wrap everything up into a failure, you can hide a poor economy that's happened before these NAFTA discussions. Yeah. You know, uh I'm just thinking of how big of a crisis I think this is. And I could be wrong. You're closer to the seat of power than, than I've ever been. Um, sometimes a physical presence by senior hands makes a difference. I remember on 9-11, and you probably remember this too, Manny. Yes. When Tony Blair, the prime minister, flew to Washington just to be there in person. I, I mean, he, I don't think he really was there for any substantive thing. He was just there to say, this is your battle of Britain. You know, this is your moment that counts, and I'm here. And I would think that Trudeau would be having emergency cabinet meetings. Maybe he would take his whole cabinet down to Washington, D.C. Maybe he would call in Brian Mulroney, John Manley, Frank McKay. He would call in all sorts of elder statesmen from both, maybe even bite his tongue and call Stephen Harper and say, hey, we've been rivals, but I need your help for the country. I, and tell me, Gretchen Martin, Harper wouldn't come to his aid if, if they asked him. Instead, Justin Trudeau's taking personal days. It's like he doesn't even know there's an alarm ringing. Well, if you, if you look at it very carefully, Ezra, there isn't much to be done. You don't need these experts that we've had in the past. There is basically no trade 
difference between Canada and U.S. There's a slight variance depending on you look at it. The United States is not asking for anything unreasonable. They've presented, a, they'll take a bilateral agreement. They'll, they'll do a deal quickly. What's happening with the delay, I, I think, it's because there's a Mexican election. And Justin Trudeau and the Liberals do not want to do this alone without Mexico. Mexico has halted their discussions. We could do it without Mexico, bring certainty to ourselves, bring certainty to the Canadian economy. But that's why there's a delay. I think we're waiting for Mexico. There isn't anything that we need any expertise. This deal could have been done in, in, in a very short order. There isn't anything that's offensive that America has asked for. Uh, at, so long as we drop a few things that most people think they, that's offensive. As well, there's, a, there's another a, a problem that's happening that I, Canadians haven't been looking at. And that is, while we are engaged in doing nothing, Trump has gone to China, has gone to Japan, has gone to South Korea. Now, let me give you the second phase of what this problem could be. China has a $375 billion surplus with the United States. Japan has a $55 billion surplus with the United States. South Korea has a $30 billion surplus. And they're negotiating it away. Think of it. If you're doing your massive trade with the United States and you are in a surplus with them and you have Trump knocking on your door, what is China, Japan and South Korea going to do to please its largest customer? They're going to shift their buying preferences to America. And that now, if you, by way of example, if there is a $20 billion purchase of resources from China in Canada, all they have to do is start buying that from America, and that reduces the, the, um, the surplus and reduces the disparity. The second phase that's going to hurt Canada is when all the countries, and I will include the EU in this, because there is a deficit as well. In order to bring balance, they're going to have to shift their buying, and they're going to shift it to prefer the American producer, whether it be wheat, whether it be anything that we produce with America. And if we had a small little advantage over America, China, Japan, South Korea, EU will say, you know what, just to stop the trade war and to bring balance with our biggest and best customer in America, let's buy America and let's not buy Canada. And by the way, Canada doesn't care. Canada's not fighting. Canada's not scrapping. So let's buy wheat from America. Let's buy minerals from America. Let's buy lumber from America. And let's not worry about Canada because they're not in the game. Hmm. That's the second problem. Manny, let me add one more wrinkle, and that is on the military side. Donald Trump has been pressuring NATO allies like Germany to increase their military spending to come closer to the 2% of GDP target. I understand that he's demanding $20 billion a year more from Canada. And again, we can tell him to buzz off, but then don't expect, don't expect America to be our, you know, older buddy, you know, senior partner in national defense. You, that's something that I don't see the Trudeau liberals going along with happily either. You got trade demands, which I think are reasonable, you think are reasonable, Trudeau's adamant, and now you have military demands. That's very much contrary to Trudeau's leftism. It, it, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, I have tweeted this almost two years ago when, when uh, Donald Trump threw his name in the hat. I understood the numbers. I looked at him. I took him as a credible person. He had said almost two years ago that there's a NATO problem. You Google it, you find out, and you say, oh, good. Look at this. Canada pays about $20 billion less. Knowing that, and I knew that two years ago, knowing that, why would you monkey around with NAFTA, knowing that that's also going to be a risk? We have opened Canada up, and that risk is not going to go away. Because we have not been, I'll say, friendly with the United States, because we've taken every shot at the president, the $20 billion is a real demand and it will come out of Canada. Just so Canadians know, $20 billion is about 8% of what the government spends in total. We're running $20 billion worth of deficits now. And so an additional $20 billion means, means a substantial amount of services that will ultimately go away. So what this is the additional risk. Trump will not let this go. And he's right about it. And NATO has said he's right about it. 
Well, and that's the thing is the dairy cartel. I mean, it's not like Trump is being aggressive and doing asking for the end of our dairy cartel, 270 percent tariffs, asking that we come closer to the spending of of American uh, NATO spending. Those aren't the, it, Trump isn't holding us to a double standard. He's asking us to come closer to his standard. And I just don't know how easy it's to rile Canadians up and say Trump's being unfair. And, and if Trump was unfair, I think Canadian leaders would probably have to say so and be thoughtful about how to negotiate it. It's just tougher to say, no, we don't want to pay our fair share of military and we want to hang on to these obviously unfair dairy cartels. It well, just seems intransigent. I put the question and I, I, I put the question in a a different way. Here's my question. How much do we satisfy Canadians' Trump hate, which we get from the media 24-7? Mm -hmm. We have our prime minister taking shots at, at, at either Donald Trump personally or the policies of America, which they ran on and which they're executing. But how much are Canadians prepared to pay? And I've got a list. There's going to be a $20 repayment of NATO per year. There's going to be a trade issue. There's going to, and that, that we can estimate at maybe between 50 to 100 billion. There's going to be the auto sector. That is about 100 billion. And then there's going to be the loss of investments that we've seen that are going to go to America. And in addition to that, we're no longer going to be able to ride in the front seat with America as world leaders. If we are put in the back seat, or if we are put in the trunk and we're no longer up there with America, with Germany, with the UK, and we slowly lose it, it could mean a devastation to Canada. So I ask Canadians, how much are you willing to pay for a fabricated Trump narrative hate that it seems to be pervasive in our media for no good reason except for destroying Canada? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I don't think this fight was even uh, likely to happen. I think we could have dodged it. D Donald Trump has never shown an aggression to Canada. He's got a beef with China, a beef with Mexico for a long time, a beef with OPEC. He's never focused on Canada. I truly believe we kept flicking his nose and flicking him and poking well, him. And finally, we've got the lion's attention. You don't want the lion's attention when you're a little bit more like a little lamb. Last word to you, well, Manny. Yeah, well, exactly that. From the beginning, the president of the United States said, Canada is not a problem. We can do a bilateral deal. Canada is not a problem. Canada is not a problem. He's repeated it. And the numbers reflect that. What we have done in order, in my opinion, in order to get, and I see it with my friends. I see it wherever I go that people are saying, oh, Donald Trump's a bully. Let's stand by Canada. That's working. And, and it's working for Justin Trudeau. And I don't know how much we're prepared to pay for this with this fight that we cannot win and this fight that's going to hurt us. It is remarkable. Yeah. I tell you, I have a deep affection for Alberta oilmen who have suffered so much over the last two years. And I have this premonition that Ontario auto workers may face a similar hardship if we don't pull out of this trajectory. Tra 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 trajectory we're I, I, Ezra, I don't think we can stop it. I think one thing we have converted, and I've been in boardrooms with billionaires similar to Donald Trump. Once we have basically threw down the gauntlet, there is no way that Donald Trump is not going to take the challenge. We didn't have to do it. And Donald Trump, even if the numbers don't reflect it, even if, I mean, you recall what he said when there was a, a press conference by Justin Trudeau right after the G7. It humiliated him and it made him look weak going to North Korea. And that is how he sees himself. We are continually trying to make him look weak either to the world or elsewhere. And that's going to be a very expensive bill and for no reason at all. But it's going to cost Canadians a fortune. Yeah. Well, Manny, it's always great to talk with you. I should say your last video was a it was a very interesting video, I thought. And our viewers agreed more than 100,000 views of that video. And the number one source of views was Americans watching wow. videos. Wow. So I think that I, I think that your point of view is uh, 
it's underrepresented in the mainstream media. And I think people were craving your straight talk, Manny, and I have no doubt that this conversation will be uh, well received as well. Thank you for I, fighting for I, Canada. Go thank ahead. you, Ezra. Ezra, I do this because I really love this country and no one is speaking for this country. And I see uh, crass politics. Uh, you know, I fought this in 1995 and I believe crass politics will harm Canada. And I will speak against conservatives. I will speak against liberals. I will speak against our government to protect Canada. Well, I'm glad you are, Manny, and hopefully it'll make a difference. Uh, we'll talk thank to you, you soon, Ezra. my friend, and we'll thank keep you. an eye on the story. All right. Thank you. Take uh, care. Thank you. That's our friend Manny Montenegrino. He's the president and CEO of Think Sharp. That's an excerpt from my daily TV show, The Ezra Levant Show. Normally it's behind a paywall, but I thought you'd like this video, so we put it on YouTube. Uh, if you want to subscribe to watch The Daily Show every day, including always two interviews a day and I read my hate mail, just click on this screen and become a premium member.